Hi, welcome to DevNet Create. I'm Rob Richardson, and let's talk about service mesh to service mesh. Do I need a service mesh? What is the impact? What choices should I make? Let's dive in. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. <laughs> I've been that person chasing the speaker, and it's never worked out for me either, which is why you can go to robrich.org, click on presentations here at the top, and here's service mesh to service mesh. You can view the slides there online right now. While we're here on robrich.org, let's click on About Me and see some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a Microsoft MVP, a Docker captain, a friend of Redgate, and a Cyril developer advocate. AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver the completed software back to the charities. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp near you, Hit me up on email or on Twitter, and let's get a give camp in your neighborhood too. Some of the other things that I've been doing, I work a lot with containers, with Docker and Kubernetes. And I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! So there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. So let's dig into service mesh to service mesh. We talked about this guy. Do you remember when you learned to drive? Do you remember that liberating experience, how you could now travel great distances? Let's imagine a country road, a small town where you can drive as fast as you want to. <laughs> that would be fun for me too. In time, we may end up in something like this, where there's lots of traffic that just congests the road really badly. Well, now what? Well, let's set a traffic cop on the edge of town. Anyone who's going too fast is gonna get uh, slowed down. He works to ensure that we're all uniformly traveling through town. Now that's great, but we're optimizing for uniformity, not for expediency. What we really want is something like this, where our cars can communicate together, prioritize traffic, uh, emergency traffic, and those that need to want to go really fast can go in one spot. Those who want to take a more leisurely pace can do that as well. By letting the cars communicate, we can now move more efficiently rather than just uniformly. We'll see similar analogies as we move into service meshes. We're gonna take a look at service meshes, compare them to what came before, and take a look at a demo of both Istio and Linkerd. Let's dig in. So a service mesh is that thing that stands in between all of our services. It allows us to manage network traffic in a very graceful and scalable way. In short, it's the answer to how do I observe, control, and secure the network in my, the communication between my microservices. So observe. We're gonna watch all of the traffic go through our cluster and be able to see how it functions. Then in time, we'll be able to understand what normal is and be able to start to craft that based on policies within our service mesh. We can also create mutual TLS between our services. And we do this inside the service mesh so we don't have to add this additional code into each microservice. Observe, control, and secure. We started out with a monolith. And the interesting thing about a monolith was we could deploy all of the pieces in one go. As we got closer to containers, we could start to deploy microservices. And we could iterate on individual pieces as often as we needed to. On the left, our internal pieces are internal. On the right, our internal pieces have IP addresses. Hmm, how do we secure the traffic between our microservices? Now, as we talk about microservices, we'll talk about both north-south and east-west traffic. North-south traffic is traffic flowing into or out of our Kubernetes cluster, where east-west traffic is traffic flowing between our microservices. So in this diagram, we have north-south traffic coming from our user interface into our cluster. We also have east-west traffic flowing between our microservices. Well, what came before? Well, before we had API gateways. Much like the traffic cop at the edge of town, this is a fence around our cluster. An API gateway is great for being able to monetize or throttle traffic coming into our cluster. But once inside of our cluster, our API gateway knows nothing about the traffic flowing around in our cluster. So in this case, our microservices aren't following the rules of connecting only to their own data stores. Hmm, if we had a mechanism where we could observe, secure, and control this traffic, we might be able to prevent that unwanted traffic flowing between microservices and other data stores. 
Sadly, an API gateway doesn't have any visibility into this and can only be that fence around our traffic. So how does the service mesh work? Without a service mesh, if service A wants to communicate with service B, it just does. It opens a socket and connects. With the service mesh, inside of the pod associated with each service is deployed a sidecar proxy. Now these are in one pod, so all of the traffic between these is in a very isolated network. So if service A wants to reach out to service B, service A will first reach out to the sidecar proxy that got deployed with it. The sidecar proxy will go check in with the control plane. Am I allowed to accept traffic from service to service B? In this case, we'll say yes, and it will create that connection to service B's proxy. Service B's proxy will check in with the control plane as well. Am I allowed to accept traffic from service A? In this case, we're gonna say yes, and it'll forward the request on the service B. The response comes back through, and we've now completed the request. Now for east-west traffic, it'll work exactly like this. For north-south traffic, we may choose to make this an ingress or this an egress, and we can do exactly the same, routing our traffic through the sidecar proxies, which check in with the control plane to validate the connections are as they should, and ultimately allow traffic to flow between the services as we need to. Now, the cool thing here is that we have this optional mutual TLS connection that allows us to secure connections between our sidecar proxies, and we didn't need to change the code in our services to make this happen. Now, this is the mechanism of a service mesh. All our traffic flows between these sidecar proxies. Now, because we have these sidecar proxies that can observe, control, and secure the traffic, we can actually level up and do some really interesting things. We're proxying between all of our services so we can watch the traffic move between them. We can then make decisions based on policies to say, no, you really can't connect to this thing. And we can secure via mutual TLS to ensure that uh, no prying eyes can see the traffic flowing through. But let's level up a bit. We can create network topology diagrams. Let's watch the traffic and identify which services connect to which. We can view service health keep track of which services are throwing non-200 status codes. And we can log this traffic so that we can understand the health over time. Let's level up again. It's more than just a proxy. Because we're proxying all traffic between all the things, we can start to do some intelligent routing. So for example, we could do A-B testing, where we have two different versions, and we can validate that our system functions better or worse with the new version. Once we've identified based on the results of our experiment, we can lean into that to optimize our user experience. Perhaps we want to create a beta channel where uh, users can use new features sooner without having to wait for releases. We can get early feedback, and we can tune those features for our other, our other users. We can also create circuit breakers. Now, if a service is having difficulty and may tip over, all of the clients are going to notice that, and of course, if they think it's a transient concern, and they'll retry. So as the service comes back up, it'll just get flooded with all of this additional traffic. Now, we can create a circuit breaker that will just stop all the traffic to this service and let it recover gracefully, let it come back up to speed, and then open back up and let the traffic flow to it. Now, unlike the circuit breaker in your house, you don't need to walk up to the panel to reset it. The circuit breaker here will do that automatically once the service is ready. So we also get some really elegant dashboards of visualizing our traffic flowing through our system. This can be really elegant. So we want to prevent unexpected traffic patterns. We saw how microservices call into each other's data stores. We'll need to work with our developers to ensure that they code their applications differently. But we can very specifically block unwanted traffic patterns in our cluster. So which service mesh should I use? Istio, Linkerd, Console, Open Service Mesh, others? Now, as we compare features, they're all moving very fast. So we don't want to say, this one has this feature. Instead, let's compare them by methodologies. When we first look at Linkerd, Linkerd likes to own the entire system. They're really good at contributing to the Rust network stack. But all the things inside of Linkerd are pretty much built by Linkerd. They have a really elegant startup experience, and we'll get to see that in a moment. By comparison, Istio is kind of the kitchen sink. They like to bundle the best of open source packages and allow you to turn things on and off based on flags. Now, in both cases, they have that same methodology of creating a sidecar proxy and routing the traffic through the sidecar proxy, checking in with the control plane. So let's take a look at both Linkerd and Istio. We'll start with Linkerd. So Linkerd is a really great uh, startup experience. 
So let's uh, come to the Linkerd docs and we'll download the um, Linkerd CLI. And then we'll do a Linkerd check dash dash pre. After that, Linkerd install, pipe it to kubectl, apply. And I've done both of those. Let's next run Linkerd check and validate that our system is as we expect. Yep, it looks like the system is running just fine. There's an upgrade that I can grab. Next up, let's go grab the dashboards. Now I'm going to take this and apply it into place. And now it's going to run each of those dashboards, getting all of that content into place. Now that's great. Next up, I can start to um, validate that this works. We can do a Linkerd check again. And what I like about Linkerd check is not only will it go check to see if all the things are running, but in this case, it's going to wait for my visualization tools to spin up until it's ready. Once we've got the visualization tools ready, we can now dig into each of the dashboards and start to explore Linkerd. Now, Linkerd does have a great sample application, and we won't have a moment to dig into that today. But let's grab this Linkerd dashboard and visualize how it works. It may take us a minute to get the content installed. Uh, go, 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 go. This is definitely one of those bandwidth constrained operations. <laughs> there we go. We've got the dashboard installed. And so let's fire up Linkerd's dashboards. Perfect. Now we're going to fire up this dashboard. We've got all of our content in place. Let's take a look at the Linkerd namespace because Linkerd does proxy the traffic to the Linkerd dashboards, uh, the Linkerd content. And let's pop open the Grafana dashboard for one of them. Now, this cluster hasn't been running very long, but we can already see um, traffic patterns associated with this content. That's great. Now, if we want to look at this content, we can also pull um, uh, metrics associated with this through Prometheus. But we can also pull, um, not that one, we can also uh, view these visualizations from the command line as well. So here's the stats associated with all of them. We can see the um, success rate, the latency, and the number of connections that have been connected to each of our containers. That's great. Now let's turn off Linkerd. Oh, there we go. And let's flip over to Istio. Now, in a similar way of Linkerd, we can go to the Istio Getting Started page. We will download the Istio CTL, uh, CLI, and then we can launch into one of the demos. Now, they do have a really great demo of um, a bookstore. Here's the bookstore application, and we can see here's the product page. The product page reaches out to the product details page, uh, microservice, and it also reaches out to the reviews service. We see that with version one, there are no stars. With version two, the stars are in black color. And in version three, the stars are in red color. The black color and red colored stars also reach out to the rating service so that we can see how many stars we should de deploy, display. So we just got those uh, set back up so that we have all three of the star colors in place. And now let's take a look at the Istio dashboards. First up, we'll take a look at Istio CTL dashboard Prometheus. Now, the Prometheus dashboard allows us to look at the metrics harvested from Prometheus. So for example, it's the request total. And I can see the each of the requests and all of the details. Uh, execute. <laughs> Demo fail there. Um, as we move into uh, visualizing this content, we may choose to visualize it with um, Grafana. So let's flip over to the Grafana dashboard. And we can now take a look at uh, that Istio content uh, pushed into Grafana. So we have some default dashboards. And we can see that our control plane hasn't been running for a real long time. But we get to see some really great metrics about both the Istio and our application. Next up, let's take a look at the Jaeger dashboard. And the Jaeger dashboard is really good for visualizing interactions between our system. So if we take a look at um, our uh, product page, 
and find traces, we can see that it started here and then it called this one and then it called this one. If we're looking for a slow place in our application, this uh, reviews default seems to be taking a really long time getting from the results of this call into the results of this call. That can be a really elegant way to diagnose system failures here with Jaeger. Next up, let's take a look at Kiali. What I like about Kiali is it allows us to build a network diagram of our system. So I'll log in here and pull up the graph. Now, it's definitely a real-time system. So let's come back in here and refresh our page and get some uh, traffic with each of the colored uh, stars. And then coming back to the Kiali dashboard, we can take a look at not just what the developer thought was going to happen, but we can see what's actually happening. The product page goes to here, and that goes to the review service, and it will go to each of those review pages. Uh, if we refresh another time or two, we'll probably see the connections into, there we go, into the rating service. Now, what's elegant about this is this is what's actually happening, not what the developer thought was happening. So for example, if we don't see our connections to the rating service, or if we don't see the connections to the review service, maybe we left in a debug statement that um, am amidst the traffic and uses simulated results instead. Kiali is really good at being able to compare to our developer notes. So that was a really elegant tour through the dashboards associated with um, Istio. And we can see that methodology where Linkerd focuses on an easy setup experience and Istio focuses on a kitchen sink. So what do we see? Well, from the crawl stage, we have monitoring, logging, and service health. When we go from crawl to walk, we have intelligent routing where we could create AB channels and um, uh, canary channels. And finally, in the run stage, we get a really elegant network topology diagram where we see what's actually happening, not what the developer thought was happening. Now, should I use a service mesh? Service mesh is not for free. On the left, we have all of the details associated with Kubernetes. We have the Kubernetes control plane. We have all of the pods that are doing our work. And on the right, we have all the details associated with our service mesh the service mesh control plane and the sidecar proxies. You'll probably have about double the number of containers running in your cluster that you had before. And maybe the sidecar proxies are a little bit lighter than your Tomcat app, but you should expect probably you know, 1.6 or 1.8 times the compute. And that's a non-trivial cost increase for your cloud hosting. We were able to observe, control, and secure the traffic because we're proxying traffic between all the places. Now, should I use a service mesh? Here's some best practices. If you need to secure really high sensitive workloads away from normal workloads, such as PKI or PCI, service mesh can be perfect. If you're running untrusted workloads and you want to segregate those away from things, then a service mesh can be great. Now, in Kubernetes, we have namespaces, but a namespace is not a trust boundary, not a security boundary. So if we're running multi-tenant workloads and we want to carve out a namespace per tenant, then a service mesh can allow us to create those policies. If we need security in depth, if we need to be able to validate that all traffic flowing between microservices is HTTPS, then the service mesh be, may be great. And if we need AB routing or a beta channel, then we can use the service mesh. It's not for free, but it can be really helpful in being able to observe, control, and secure the traffic in our service mesh. If you're watching this video later, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich.